Hey there, students. I am here to read pages 62 through 68 of the Hope Chest. You are welcome to read them out loud or listen to me read it out loud. You're welcome to follow along while I read it out loud, or you can read it yourself in your book, whichever you choose. So the picture of my background today, this is an alley in Washington, D.C. around the year 1920. Uh, so at the very beginning of this chapter, Myrtle's going to take Violet to some of her to part of her old neighborhood uh, as they're trying to find Chloe. Um, and so this is maybe something of what it could have looked like back then. Chapter 6. It all comes down to Tennessee. Violet could see the high needle of the Washington Monument in the distance as they picked their way across the gravel bed of the rail yard and stepped over rails and railroad ties. The smell of the coal smoke and axle grease hung over everything. Rows of empty boxcars loomed on every side, and Violet could see smoke rising from a clump of trees where there must be a hobo jungle. It wasn't how Violet had imagined Washington would look. The important thing, though, was whether she would be able to find Chloe here. Violet was glad Myrtle was from Washington. She would know her way around. Do you know where to find the suffragists? Violet asked Myrtle. Before we find anything, we better get cleaned up, Myrtle said, or anybody we find is going to scream for the cops. Myrtle led Violet out of the rail yard and down a cobblestone street with automobiles parked on it here and there. They turned down an alley and then down another alley that led off of it. The alley was just was only just wide enough for a wagon to pass through. Brick and wooden homes, houses lined both sides of it. The houses looked looked as if someone had built them in a great hurry fifty years ago and then fled. Probably to escape the fury of the people who had to live in them, Violet thought. The houses had no windows that Violet could see. To make up for the slack, there were a few holes where chunks of the wall had fallen off. Heaps of uncollected garbage overflowed from garbage cans and filled the corners, and the reek of rotten vegetables and mold mixed with the stench of raw sewage. A well-fed-looking rat ambled out of a pile of trash, looked at the girls thoughtfully, and waited for them to pass by. This isn't really how I imagine Washington, Violet admitted. Myrtle smiled thinly. No, they don't show this on the picture postcards. Colored children lurked here and there in the alley, but neither, but they neither looked at nor spoke to Myrtle and Violet. This is where I used to live, Myrtle said. It's called Laos Home Alley. Laos Home Alley, Violet said, not sure she'd heard right. Laos Home Alley, Myrtle repeated firmly. Here's where we used to wash up. Myrtle led the way down a narrow passage off the alley, which ended in a dirt-paved courtyard where a single water faucet came up from a pipe in the ground. There was a toilet of sorts, a shed that housed a long wooden box with holes cut in it. A horrible smell emanated from the deep pit beneath. Violet tried to pretend that this was nothing unusual to her, since her disgust was so clearly amusing to Myrtle. Violet liked Myrtle, but would, wouldn't have minded it if she were a little less of a know-it-all. They ducked their heads under the faucet and scrubbed. Violet watched charcoal-colored water run down Myr from Myrtle's face and hair, and she was sure it did from hers, too. Myrtle took off her apron, revealing an apron-shaped area of blue and white stripes on her now black dress. She tossed the apron and mob cap into the corner of the courtyard. You're lucky your clothes were navy blue, said Myrtle. She was right, Violet thought. The dirt didn't show as much. Score a point for Mother. Violet wondered if Mother was worried about her. Maybe she was just mad. It was an uncomfortable thought. Violet had never done anything as bad as running away before. Coming out of the alley seemed to take less time than going in had. Soon they were, they were on an ordinary street of ordinary brick houses. Two colored women sat on a set of stone steps, one of them rocking a baby carriage with her foot. Some boys played marbles. There were no heaps of garbage and no rats. They turned into another street, wide and clean swept, and lined with tall brick houses with bay windows. Model T's and some bigger, more expensive cars were parked along the street. There's a suffrage lady who lives here, Myrtle explained, leading Violet up a set of stone steps to a brick house. She rapped on the door with a brass knocker. The lady who opened the door was colored, with, a gray, with gray hair piled high on top of her head, and dressed in a blue brocaded dress with a high collar. There was something regal about her, Violet thought. She couldn't tell if the woman's bearing on her nose, she couldn't tell if it was the woman's bearing on her nose, which was long and had a royal tilt on the end, probably both. The woman looked at Myrtle and Violet with a questioning eye. Myrtle seemed momentarily abashed but recovered. Ma'am, are you Professor Mary Church Terrell? Yes, said the lady, and you are? Myrtle Davies, ma'am, said Myrtle, and this is Violet Mayhew, and we're looking for the woman's suffrage ladies. Indeed, said Professor Terrell, raising an eyebrow at Violet. Which women's suffrage ladies? My sister came here from New York to work on women's suffrage, Violet said. I think she's working on the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Do you know? 
I am familiar with the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Yes, Professor Terrell said dryly. I think your sister is probably with Miss Alice Paul and the National Women's Party. Their headquarters is Cameroon House on the west side of Lafayette Square near the White House. Do you know how to get there? Of course, ma'am, said Myrtle. Perhaps you better wash up a bit before you go, said Professor Terrell. Good day. They walked toward the Washington Monument, passing by more blocks of tenements and corner houses, and then into neighborhoods with stately stone houses with broad lawns behind cast iron fences. Wide avenues ran into other avenues and traffic circles that they had to walk around. There was more traffic now, motor cars, some of them Model T's like the Hope Chest, some of them elaborate open limousines, packards and pierce arrows that could hold a dozen people comfortably. Dark green electric trolleys zipped down the tracks in the middle of the streets. At some of the more opulent houses, guards in uniforms stood at the doors. Those are the foreign embassies, Myrtle explained. It was getting dark when they got to Lafayette Square, a park surrounded by rather grand buildings and houses, one of which, Violet realized with a shock, was the White House. It was set back a bit behind a wide green lawn. People were strolling on the White House lawn. Violet stopped to gaze at it. She had seen pictures of the White House all her life, of course, in her school books and on postcards and on the stereoscope, but now she was standing in front of it, the place where President Woodrow Wilson lived, where Abraham Lincoln had lived. It's kind of small, small, she said at last. Myrtle raised her eyebrow. You think so? I wouldn't mind living there. They crossed Lafayette Square to a wide three-story house that stretched between two bigger buildings that had electric signs identifying them as the Cosmos Club and the Bella Blasco Theater. It was hard to believe that it was only yesterday morning that Violet had left Susquehanna. It seemed like a week ago. She wondered if Chloe could possibly be here. The place seemed so grand and un -Chloe like Chloe had always talked about living in a log cabin in Alaska. Violet reached up and pulled the door knocker. I'll get it, Miss Paul, a voice said. The door opened and a young woman with a bob brown hair looked down at them in surprise. What on earth? She stepped back and started to close the door. Violet felt panic rising in her throat. Was she never going to find Chloe? I'm Chloe Mayhew's sister, she cried desperately. The woman creaked open again. Chloe Mayhew's sister? The woman said. Yes, said Violet. Is she here? I need to talk to her. The woman frowned at Myrtle. And this is... I'm Myrtle Davies. May we come in, please, said Violet. She knew this was rude, but the woman's expression suggested she was still going to close the door in their faces, and Violet had been through too much for that. She wanted to see Chloe. Now. I suppose, said the woman, frowning at Myrtle. They stood in the entrance hall while the young woman hurried away, calling, Miss Paul! Thanks for listening.